some new dance moves thanks to the conference look at that <laughs> right we got more than just a shoulder roll now we have wisdom and knowledge and, and unity, and unity right? <laughs> right. from sati mara from the conference yeah she's gonna love it when she hears upgraded. this episode <laughs> yeah we upgrade it up let me upgrade you from the conference okay i That's love funny. it hello 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 my friend how are you I'm great. How are you doing? Tired. That's why I'm looking forward to this episode. But outside of that, I'm great. Right? Yes. What about you? It is hard to believe that a week ago, we were in the middle of our first ever Women Connected in Wisdom conference. Yeah. Had 119 people sign up whoop, whoop, for our very yes. first one. Yes. We look to that growing exponentially next year. But mm -hmm. y'all, if you missed it, go to the website, womenconnectedinwisdom.com. Check out our awesome speakers. They have free things, free gifts, and there's ways to get a hold of the recordings if you're interested in that. So yeah. should we do our official official intro and kick this podcast off today? Absolutely. Episode 91. Let me get there. 91. You look really good for 91, my friend. Thank you. Shayla, well, that's what we <laughs> you, said, you're right? glowing from head to toe. <laughs> okay, I, I have it, okay, we're gonna keep going hi ladies i am shannon mitchell a black millennial business owner the founder of shalo glow llc and an amazon best-selling author i teach you how to glow from head to toe i'm also your champion for natural self-care and intentional business systems mm. Hi, y'all. I'm Christine Gotro, a white social justice advocate, an international speaker, coach, also an Amazon bestselling published author, and dancing social worker who helps you upgrade yourself and community care. Yes. And together we are Women Connected in Wisdom, a podcast rooted in the eight dimensions of wellness. And we're also the co-founders of the Women Connected in Wisdom community. We like to get together every week for intentional conversations about how to be well in business and life and relationships. How do we do this? Right. We so like to much. bring in experts, especially when we're not good at it. We need help. <laughs> Ken, what would you do? You call a friend. I need to call a friend, call two friends, and let's figure it out. Today is definitely a phone a friend day after the last couple of launches we've had. It is like, okay. It's been a, right. Okay, so we talked about it. Let's take a second, right? Since we're mm -hmm. on podcast, what well, we come for. So this year, I have started one salary position. Right. Mm -hmm. That was January. Top golf. Went to another salary position. Went to pop it up. Right. Then I did kitchen manager training. That's outside of mm -hmm. uh, starting Absolutely. the second business and the and third the business and launching the book, rebranding mm -hmm. and working with SCAD in the two classes. Right. And mm -hmm. now we're launching the community. So I cannot wait. to. Talk oh, about and you this. forgot the little thing of the That's conference great. for four days. And, the, and an international <laughs> four day conference. Right. <laughs> so it's like launch and launch. And we're just. We're in, we're running and it's a marathon, you know, right. so I'm really excited about um, talking about different ways to rest today when we talk about our physical wellness. So let me go to the definition so we can jump into our conversation. For physical wellness, it is the ability to maintain a quality of life that allows you to thrive in your daily activities without undue fatigue or physical stress. Physical wellness recognizes that our daily choices, habits, and behaviors have an impact on our overall health, well-being, and quality of life. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That are daily choices, right? Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking about that, and I look forward to having this conversation with our guests in just a minute. But I, I was thinking about that because I caught myself what was I saying to my family? It was something about the busiest week I've had or something, you know, because I mean, part of that is really true. We've got this conference, this is going on. And then um, Facebook of all things was what popped up to keep me honest. Cause um, this month is always a busy month. I don't know how it is for other people's schedules, but like 
three years ago, I was speaking at the Parliament of World Religions and I was in Ontario, Ontario, Canada, and all those pictures popped up, right? And it was back to back with another. And I was like, oh yeah, I've been keeping the schedule. Like, mm, this may not be like a one-off thing. I may need to reevaluate the level of activity that's been happening for a couple of years now. So I think it's very ironic that we're talking about sacred rest today. I mean, we scheduled it this way, but we knew coming off this conference, coming off this book launch, that we needed to talk about our rest schedule because we've been burning the candle a little bit at both ends. Yeah, we have. And it's interesting because every day I'm like, do I go to sleep right now or do I do something over here? <laughs> you know, right? do, I, do I write the email or do I hear right? the projections and the schedule and state get organized over here or right? fold this over here, you know, but no, like there is. Ooh. And that's why I'm glad that we've been working on the time management with the money management, right? Because if all of that is not as organized as possible, it gets chaotic and then it starts going over to our physical wellness because we're holding that physical stress of what should be what I should have done when really, like we talked about with Laurel Ann Stark at the conference, again, three and a half hours a day is just beauty labor and taking care of the household stuff, c cooking, organizing. The unpaid stuff. Right? Yeah, uh, right. yeah, all the unpaid stuff. So that other stuff, what's realistic to get done and then having grace on where we're at with the capacity, with whatever context we have to keep in consideration for that day, right. you know? Yeah. Well, I am definitely all transparency to our listeners, folks mm -hmm. that are listening live or listening on the repeat. Um, it's very ironic to me and funny that I woke up with a little insomnia this morning at about 4.30 a.m. So we're coming into this show of sacred rest with me being lack of sleep. But I would love to pull up our expert if you're ready, Shannon, because I need all the help I can get with this. Yes, I need help too. It's been very busy and I'm super <laughs> excited to know more um, so I can be intentional about how we do all this. I love it. How do we do it? So Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith is a board certified internal medicine physician, speaker, and award-winning author. She is an international well-being thought leader featured in numerous media outlets, including Prevention, MSNBC, Women's Day, Fox, Fast Company, Psychology Today, Inc., CNN Health, and TED.com. She is the author of numerous books, including her bestseller, Sacred Rest, Recover Your Life, Renew Your Energy, Restore Your Sanity, including insight on the seven types of rest needed to optimize your productivity, increase your overall happiness, overcome burnout, and live your best life. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited about this. Over 250,000 people have discovered their personal rest deficits using her free assessment at restquiz.com. We're going to put that in our show notes too. And you can learn more about Dr. Sandra at drdaltonsmith.com. And y'all know we'll put all that in our show notes so you can connect. Here we go, y'all. Woo! Welcome, Welcome to the to show. You. Welcome. Hi, lady. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm doing I'm great. great. Good. Good. I'm so excited to talk to you about the seven different types of rest. Yes, yes looking forward, forward to it as well. well. I, you heard me say I'm a little bit sleep deprived. I'm hearing an echo, y'all. So I'm not sure. I, I am. And we, we check that, y'all. We check that sound checked before. But you heard me say I'm sleep deprived, which is not a normal state that I'm in. Um, but I know it's normal for a lot of Americans and probably other folks all over the world. So I have a couple of questions to start with. First of all, where did the idea in the book about sacred rest come from? Well, the, the book initially, initially came to really, really from, from me burning, burning out. out. I had a I time had in my own my life when I completely, completely burned out, out after, after being in being practice, practice for about, about 10, 10 years. years. And, and I just I had my, my children. children. They were, they newborns. were newborns. And so, well, one, so one was one newborn, newborns, and one and was two, one years, two old. years old. Um, um, and what and ended what up happening is, is I had I to had figure, figure out a way for me, for me to be able to continue, continue within my it. medical practice, within the career that I love, and still be able to function properly. 
And we often have guests on the show that talk about this. You hear in our intro when we talk about like, how do we do it, especially as women, um, which a lot of women are still the household managers. They're the main caregivers. They're a lot of women are sandwiched in between children and parents. Um, and if they're not, they're taking care of communities and they're activists or they're doing all of that. Right. So I love this topic of how do we do it? And so it sounds to me like your answer is, are these seven types of rest? That is correct. For, for myself, what I've noticed is that I personally, when I was going through this process of burnout, I had to figure out how am I going to be able to continue in the job that I love, because I love medicine, uh, and still be able to do it effectively without I'm having to quit it. And without having to go on a vacation every time, you know, the time I got tired, without having to carve out large periods of time. And so really the seven types of rest was looking at how do I restore myself throughout the day, throughout the week? What are those integrative restorative practices that I can use? Um, and I think for most of us, when you say you're tired, you just think, oh, if I get enough sleep, then I should wake up feeling refreshed. But what happens when you get eight hours and you wake up still exhausted? That's, That's what I had to figure out for myself. How do I remain energized without taking vacations all the time, without having to quit my job? And those seven types include things like physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, social, sensory, and creative. Where do we know those from, right? They go right in alignment with the eight dimensions of wellness. I love that. Will you say more? Me or Shannon? <laughs> you, you. Oh, okay. Um, so this, with those seven different types, I think what I had to really help myself figure out first before then I started teaching other people was specifically, how do I determine what kind of tired I am? Because saying that you're fatigued is really insufficient. As a physician, if someone comes to me and say, hey, doc, I hurt, what do I do with that? I don't even know where to begin to look, what, what, treatments to begin to offer need something specific to direct the care. I think too often with self-care, we just say, hey, I'm tired, but we don't actually identify what's tired. And that's really how the seven types of rest have helped, I feel, most people. It gave them vocabulary to identify where their fatigue is and then helps them to be able to be more intentional and specific in the time of restorative activities that they use for their for their for for themselves. And that was my favorite thing about the article that I saw on LinkedIn, right? Because sometimes I'll come home and even if I've worked 15, 16 hours that day after however much sleep, I might not want to go right to sleep. I might want to stay up and read something or uh, watch something to not have to actively use my analytical side of my brain. I can just enjoy being entertained, right? And I said, why is that? I knew that was true, but how can I be so tired but still feel more rested with less sleep if I spent my time a certain way? Would you mind going through what the seven different types of rest are? Yeah. So physical rest specifically deals with what we most often think about our physical bodies. So it has two components. It has the active component, which includes things like stretching and yoga and massage therapy and leisure walks, those things that actually help with the circulation and the lymphatics of the body. Then it also includes passive physical rest, which are things like sleeping and napping. So it's those things that, you know, you're, that you really don't have a whole lot of control over, but are an aspect of the physical component of rest. And I think what's important to understand is that if you have a, any type of rest deficit in any of these seven types of rest, they can ultimately affect your ability to get high quality sleep. Because, you know, as we go into things like mental rest deficits and um, social rest deficits, those things can interfere with your ability to actually be able to sleep. So I'll discuss mental rest deficits next, because for those people who've ever laid down at night to go to sleep and you're exhausted, um, but your mind won't shut up. You're thinking all the thoughts, you're processing information, you're, you're ruminating over your to-do list for the next day. Those are all signs of a mental rest deficit. Your mind is overly active. You're, you're not able to turn your brain off, so to speak. And so you want to be able to find those activities that help you to do that, to be able to kind of close some of those mental taps back up. 
Um, some simple ways people do that include things like um, brain dumping before going to bed, mindfulness type activities, um, decreasing multitasking. All of those are ways that you can improve that. Thank you, because I was just about to ask that. Because usually I don't have an issue with it, except if I'm in a big event. But like this morning, I feel like that's what woke me up. Is like I hadn't done an effective brain dump, and so my brain woke me up to say, "Oh, you have to remember this, right?" And I was like, "Are you kidding me, brain?" Like I have a rule that if it's before five o'clock, it really should be illegal to be awake. Like it's, it's my own personal rule. But I'm like, okay, five a.m. or later, you're okay. But if I get woken up before five, mm, I'm not a huge fan. So I think what you're describing is what happened to me this morning at approximately 4.30 a.m. My brain went, ta-da! So, so and, and, you know, we know, talk about the wisdom in action. And I'm sorry to cut you off. You want to? Okay. Um, it makes me think maybe it might not be something that you need all the time, right? But if you're traveling or you have a big event and you, or maybe if you're at a conference, if we're physically there, maybe that's when you need to have something by the bed to write it down or just take time to write it down before you go to sleep. That makes a lot of sense. Or you yes. Yeah. And you're right. It really does vary based on what's going on in your specific life and, and how you're processing information, because there are going to be time periods when you are, are kind of ruminating over thoughts more than others. Anytime that you're in anything new, if you're, a, if you're a, a thinker, someone who tends to overthink things, new situations, complicated situations, when problems arrive, so when you're trying to branch out or be creative, all of those are going to activate the brain to be more productive in processing. And so when you know that that's the stage that you're in within your business, then it is helpful to have notepads by the bedside or anywhere so that you can quickly dump information and not require your brain to continue to hold on to it. I love that idea. And I'm just going to state the obvious here. So other people don't make the same mistake I did. So I often use my phone to do notes, but I can't do that when I'm doing a brain dump either at night or in the morning. Cause then it activates my brain because of seeing the screen. So I learned that the hard way. <laughs> it's like, yeah, don't do that. Don't turn on your phone to write it down. That's a really, point, really go old school with a notepad and notebook because otherwise my little brain goes, Whoa, it's time to wake up. <laughs> I think you have a big brain, but I hear I what agree. you're saying. Thank you. I got you. You know what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> so we so get, we got, got two of them, them right? right? Dr. Dalton Smith. Smith. So there's so still five, five more. more. Yeah. yeah. And so and one that, that you just mentioned and, uh, really is sensory, sensory rest. rest. And that's and the rest that's dealing with how we use our senses. And as you mentioned, when you open up your phone, that's one way that you increase your sensory input. And there's so many other ways. We really just have to be mindful of our sensory environments in the places where we spend most of our time. What are the background noises? What are the lights? What, you know, what are the things that we're experiencing within our environment? And those things have an effect on us more than just even our ability to sleep, but even our personalities. Because if you become sensory overwhelmed, most of us respond to sensory overload syndromes with either irritation, agitation, rage, or anger. And so if you find that you tend to be very irritable at the end of the day, and you work in a place that maybe you're hearing the elevator go off all day long, and you think you're ignoring it, you think, you know, your subconscious has blocked it out, your subconscious can only block it out by being actively engaged in the process of filtering it. So be aware of all of that sensory input, because it does have an effect on you. Well, I also have a curiosity for people that are identify as neurodivergent and like folks with ADHD and autism, like, do you address that in the book about, because to me, that would be additional sensory rest might be needed. It is, it is. absolutely. Um, um, the book is used by a lot of therapists and people that are specifically managing people with ADHD. And, you know, I don't specifically go through that in the book. I focus, I stay in my lane. I focus on the seven types of rest and the research that I did. But I, but I'm seeing a lot of people extrapolate the information because it does apply to so many different situations from therapists using it with their mental health patients to teachers using it with their students. I think the big part of that is, is for them to, I, to understand how different things are affecting their rest. Uh, from, from my standpoint, that's the part that I try to try to help people contribute in that area. 
Love that. Okay, so we talked about sensory rest, right? What's the next? What's the fourth one? The fourth is creative. And so someone who is using uh, creative energy in any way, whether that is problem solving, whether that's innovation, whether that's brainstorming, whether that's thinking outside of the box, researching, um, if, you're, if you're an author and you're writing words, if you're a musician and you're coming up with music, if you're a speaker and you're crafting talks, if you're an entrepreneur and you're pitching, all of those are signs of creativity being used. And so I, what we found is that most people, although they use an excessive amount of creative energy, are not as intentional in getting creative rest. They don't understand that that's a part of them that can be depleted. And so because it's a place that can be depleted, it can result in a rest deficit. And so a lot of people are saying, I'm so tired, and they're trying to get, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten hours of sleep. But really the type of tired they are is they're creatively tired. And so the way we restore creative rest is by allowing ourselves to appreciate beauty in whatever form that is. Whether it's natural beauty, like, like you know, being out in the na in nature and going to the park or the beach or the ocean or you know, looking at flowers and trees, or if it's man-made beauty, like listening to music or art or being a play or dance, all of those things inspire us. They awaken our creative thinking process and allow us to kind of have that all like child, that childlike awe and wonder and fill us back up creatively. And we have to understand that if we're pouring out creatively, there has to be times when we allow ourselves to just appreciate what has already been created. And just to put a differentiation here, this is not the same as taking an art class or pottery class with your girlfriends. That's actually creative work. You're putting a demand on your own creativity during those times. You're getting social rest because you're out with your girls and you're having fun, but you're not getting creative rest then. Creative rest is when you appreciate what has already been created. Go to an art museum. You're looking at what's already been done. That's more of what I'm referring to. That's when I go off the grid. Like it makes perfect sense to me. So when I need creative rest, I go to the woods. I go to nature. I or I take my, I'll take my camera out not to create anything, but just to capture like the flowers or the mountains, or I'll go to the waterfalls. You know. So what you're saying makes oh, my body is just like, yes, and it's overdue. <laughs> yeah, and it, it reminds me of when I was talking about listening to audiobooks and stuff, right? At first, I was against audiobooks because I love physical books. But I said, you know what? If CEOs read a certain amount of books a year, I need to make sure that I'm getting that much information. If I don't have the time to physically read it, I'll listen to it. But then I realized that you can only listen to so much and you have to have that period of application, right? So it can't just be consume, 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 do, figure out. It's like, listen, I need to watch TV for a second and have somebody else tell me what they did. You know, what's the, what's the mystery over here that I can find out without having to figure it out myself? You know what? This solves, this is the answer to a question I've had. So Dr. Dalton Smith, We've talked about this on the show before, but one of my go-to, and I didn't realize it was my go-to rest, but is um, reality TV shows about creativity. So like the cooking show or the uh, glass blowing show or even the makeup artist show, but it's exactly what you're talking about. It's creative rest because I'm not creating, but I'm watching somebody else create and, and fulfill their dreams. And that's so satisfying to me. And that has been my go-to throughout the whole pandemic. So that's fascinating. Yeah. So you're appreciating the beauty that someone else is creating. And that's at the very heart of that. The I two other yeah, yeah. So two other types of rest that um, we haven't discussed yet are emotional and I mentioned um, social. Uh, I discuss those typically together because they both do deal with people. Um, social rest specifically is evaluating how different people pull on your energy. So the majority of people you spend time with are negatively pulling from your social energy, your kids, your spouse, your coworkers, your clients, they're all needing things from you. So then you have to evaluate who are the people in your life who don't need anything from you? And then how regular do you actually make room and space in your life to enjoy those people? Because that's where we get social rest. When there's no demands on us socially, we're just enjoying someone's presence and, and having that back and forth of just being in their company. 
Now, emotional rest, on the other hand, deals with having the ability and the freedom, the liberty, really, to express yourself and what you're feeling. So what, you know, your emotions, your, what you're going through within that day or that week, you know, what authentically are you experiencing and being able to just be very real, raw and authentic about that without having to feel as if you have to make someone else digest your feelings a little bit easier. I think too often we try to put makeup on our, on our emotions. So that is easier for other people to bear. And there need to be at least someone in your life where you can just say it like it is. Um, whether that's a therapist, a counselor, a trusted friend, you get to pick who your emotional rest person is, or if you have more than one, who those people are, but you need to be, you need to understand that that person needs to have a very high level of respect for you, for you and, and it's not going to judge, judge you in that process, process or that's not going to come back at you. Mm, I love that. I love that differentiation. And I love what you're saying. Cause right when you were talking about social and emotional rest, two or three people popped up in my head and it was probably about three years ago or four years ago that I said, I want healthy reciprocal friendships. And those are two of the people that came into my life or that our friendships deepened. And what I'm re recognizing as you're talking is that's because they give me social and emotional rest. Like they are people I can go for a walk with. And yeah, I love that. And I, and was, I was thinking, thinking about, about this book that um, Raul, one of the, I think now he's a district manager or some higher level manager at Top Golf now. And I went out to South Carolina to train at the beginning of the year, like I was talking about. And he gave me a list of books. I always ask that, like, what are books that you like to read? One of them was talking about not expecting anything back, right? Like giving this person, if Christine and I are partners, me being the best partner that I can, supporting her the best, giving the resources at a healthy place, right? And she doesn't have to do anything back. It's not about I did this for you, you do this for me. And even though I try to operate like that, sometimes you think, or you might, let's say, be surprised when a situation goes a certain way. If you supported somebody to a certain extent and then they don't show up for you or they don't show up for themselves to finish something. Does that make sense? So you're like, well, I did this. Why did this person not do that? Well, instead of that, let's have realistic expectations. And if you do what you do because that's your purpose and your passion, then somebody can really show you who they are. And then you can find out where your emotional rest really is, right? But when we have these inauthentic relationships and people are faking their support or faking how they feel, or you're not authentic about what you need, then we don't really know where we are. And then when stuff really happens and you need somebody or something happens, or now it's COVID and the, the, the work environment is shifting, how do we address it? So that's the next part that I wanna get to. We got to all seven of the types of rest, right? The only one, one was more? spiritual rest okay, and yes. spiritual rest for the most part deals with really how we, how the need each one of us has for purpose and belonging and love, whether we experience that through a faith-based situation or if we experience that through different causes and uh, communities that we're a part of, every person needs to find kind of that connectivity where they're able to, to really just feel connected to humanity as a whole. Yeah. And it's so important because when I think about things that frustrate me, I'm I'm able to stay centered and operating from a place of love because that's the type of person that I want to be as an individual, right? So that's the place that I'm able to come from, but not because America has loved Black women so much, right? Because I know God loves me, he validates me, and then I can operate in the world outside of that energy. Um and we work a lot, right? We talked about our work schedules. That's what we're talking about. When we're launching stuff, when we're working on our business, when we're trying to support our community, how do we still rest? I know that you also help teams with this, right? So when it comes to a team aspect, what is um, the biggest challenge that you usually see them deal with and how do you help them with that? No, I'm sorry. Did you say teams or teens? Teams. Teams. As, yes. Okay, because because I also have worked with teens, so so both of those are, are dear near and dear to my heart. So with teams, but specifically, what I'm noticing is that as a leader of a team, you have to be consciously aware of the rest deficits within your within your group. And so, if you're looking at, you know, sometimes we're trying to get 
blood from a turnip, so to speak. We're trying to get our teens to be more productive, more creative, more whatever. And you're not really recognizing that they have not been restored in a way to be able to produce at the level you're asking them to produce. Most of us are producing out of our emptiness, if we're, if we're just honest. You know, we have a level of gifting and talent and grit that just makes us produce. And so we can produce even when we are completely burned out. And so over 67% of the population is burned out, yet stuff is still getting done. What we have to understand is once we help people actually understand that rest is not simply about sleeping or napping or going on vacation or quitting their jobs and changing careers and all these other things, that it's really about restoring the energy you have so that you're actually able to give from your place of fullness. So that when you do get to work or you do go or do your own company, whatever it is you're doing, you're not always giving from your emptiness, but you're giving from a place where you actually feel restored, energized and the best version of yourself. Because then you you produce at a, not only a higher capacity, but the work you produce is actually of a greater quality. You actually bring more to the world and more to your work and more to everything that you care about, your family, your, your health, every other aspect of your life improves. And not because you're doing more, it's because you're actually able to bring more of yourself to what you're doing. Oof. I love that so much. I think about our wellness practices, right? One of my wellness practices when I'm on it and in the flow is I get up and I greet the sun and I do a walking meditation and I'm outside. So I'm connecting with nature and the sun. And sometimes I negotiate with myself, oh, you need more sleep or you need. And it's very fascinating because I've been doing this for years. And actually that hour for myself in nature and doing my wellness practices feeds me more than the extra hour of sleep does. And so it goes right in line with what you're talking about, like finding out where are we restored? What, what brings that restoration in? So I have a question for you and I know we're going to circle back around. I just did your quiz online, by the way, because I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. Um, and I can't wait for the results. Um, there are two questions I have for you. So one question on the quiz was related to how we feel about the news and things like, I'm curious about what that's attached to, especially as we have this, the big midterms coming up in a week, which everybody, if you haven't early voted, we need you to early vote. Um, and Okay, so did I lose the second question? Let's just start with that first question. Yeah, well, I can kind of answer for all the questions because all the questions are interconnected in a way that you will never figure out what goes to what. Okay. And that's that's purposeful <laughs> because some of them are, are a little bit more self-explanatory just because right. like it's hard to camouflage the physical. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, does your body hurt? Does it not hurt? Right. So some of those are harder to camouflage, but quite a few of them are, are so interconnected um, in the algorithm. Um, but just specifically with news, you know, if you think about news or even news feeds like social media news, news feeds. It's, it's not, not just the social aspect of it. There's, there's also the emotional aspect of it, because, because depending on what the news, news is you're listening to, <laughs> can actually have an effect on you emotionally, can affect how you, how you feel, whether you're anxious, whether you're, whether you're happy, whether you're, you know, sad. So all of those are, are quite interconnected. Oh, I so agree with you. I'm about to head home to see my folks um, in a couple of days. And it's one of the first things I always talk to my dad about because he wakes up in the morning and turns on the news and has it on like just constant. And I'm like, dad. And then he talks about like, he's worried or he's anxious. And I'm like, yeah, turn that off. Cause even if you're not thinking that it's coming in, it's just coming in. Like I know within 10 minutes, it's coming in. <laughs> like It's like, wow. And the problem is if depending on your dad's just innate personality, if he happens to be someone who mulls over information in their head, he's a processor. And so things just don't bounce off. You know, they actually go in and then middle of the night, his brain's kind of thinking all of these thoughts. Mm -hmm. Then what ends up happening is not only are you pulled in mental rest deficits, now you have a uh, emotional one as well, and potentially a sensory run if the TV is playing 24 seven. You know, and so too loud. Right. <laughs> oh, wait, that was my judgment. That probably should have been an inside thought, but okay. <laughs> Shannon, what are you thinking about over there when you're listening to all this? 
No, it makes sense. You know, and I was I was thinking about I want to take the quiz too. As soon as I saw it, I said, Yeah, let's go ahead and see where we are. Just like the inner ally quiz, I want to see where my self-compassion level is. Um, but it's interesting. I'm grateful to have the information. I I need to sit with it a little bit, you know, and think I, again, I think what I need to do is take the quiz and figure out how am I tired? How do I think about it? Just, I think taking the quiz will help me with a lot of that stuff that help me know how I can apply it. I am curious, Dr. Dalton Smith, what are your wellness practices? Like what gives you rest? Cause you are a doctor, a mom, active in your community, best-selling author, on doing all this speaking and talking, how do you do it? We're looking to you. <laughs> yeah. So, and I run a company. So, you know, it's one of those things where what I found for myself is every morning when I get up, the very first thing that I do is I kind of just do a quick self-check. I think self-awareness is at the very root of all of it. And so I hop out of the bed. It's like, do I hop out of the bed or do I roll over and think, oh God, I don't have the energy for this today. Because if I do that, then I know somewhere, yes, the day prior, I didn't restore an area that's just, is still depleted. And so my goal is to always hop out of the bed with some level of energy. And so when I hop out, I initially start thinking about, you know, what are my plans for that day? Where am I going to be expending my energy? I'm just going to using, for example, what you ladies were just talking about for yourself. If I'm hopping out of bed and I know this week, you know, I'm focusing on um, launching a, a conference or running a conference. What kind of energy am I going to be using to do that? Well, I'm going to be sitting in front of a screen. So I got a lot of sensory input. So what can I do to downgrade that sensory input in the middle of running a four day conference? I have a conference I do as well every year. And so some of the things I might do during that week might include blocking out five minutes just to go sit with my eyes closed. So when the attendees having their break, rather than me stressing out and worrying about all the details, I'm going to go lay on the floor with my eyes closed. I might roll on the foam roller if I've been sitting in the chair for eight hours. Um, I might do jumping jacks, you know, something to get my body moving. My mind, if I'm writing, if I'm in the middle of book writing season and I'm having to be really creative and come up with words and phrases and all of those things, then I make a, a specific dedicated point to surround myself with creative images. And so my lock screen, I'll, I'll set it to scroll all of the waterfalls and colors and streams and oceans, all of these pictures that whenever my computer, you know, when I'm pausing and I'm thinking and my computer goes to its lock screen, it is always a nature setting because that's what restores me. My husband knows when I'm writing, he will buy me flowers. Flowers are my love language. Nature is my love language. So he can't pick me up and take me somewhere in, if I'm writing, but he'll bring it to me. So he'll bring flowers in, fresh flowers. Um, I'll specifically block time out to go for a walk when I'm actively writing. I'll actually put into the schedule, just go outside, sit on the deck and just look at nothing or go outside and do a five minute walk around the house. If my stressor is specifically that I know I'm draining is I'm going to go into the hospital. Whereas that typically for me tends to be more emotional draining because as an internist, you deal a lot with death. And so, um, I know that's going to be emotionally draining for me. Then I'll block off time to later on that week to be with my girlfriends who I can actually have that kind of conversation with. I should say two specific girlfriends <laughs> where I can have that specific kind of conversation with. And they understand that if I'm sad or if I'm mourning the loss of a patient, they're okay with me processing that in front of them. Whereas I can't process that in front of the patient's family. Or, you know, I can't process that in front of my nurses um, because it's not appropriate. The professionalism of it requires that I keep that in check. But I have to have some people to process that in front of. That's why physician suicides through the roof. Most of us are trying to not process it. But we have to have that in place. And so that's kind of how I go about it. I look at what's going on that day or that week, and I make sure that I am intentional about getting restorative practices built into my day. That was just such an affirmation for what we talk about on the show and for how we are doing our best to live our lives. Thank you for that. Um, and I heard you and I want to make sure I heard you right, because I like to get really specific, especially for myself. You're checking once a week, like you do a check in once a week with your schedule to look at the balance of it. I do it. I do it daily, weekly and monthly is how I do this. Okay. 
I make sure that I look at my schedule for the entire week because some act, some restorative activities you can't really do every day. Right. Like I'd love to hang out with my girls every day, but that's just not realistic. We got kids, spouses, <laughs> jobs, right. you know what I mean? But we can usually fit in at least once a week or a couple of times in a month to okay. do something together, even if it's virtual, you know, or even if it's just kind of a, a, a kind of a, what do they call it? Um, FaceTime or what's it? That's what we use mm-hmm. kind of chat. Um, so even if it's that, and then every day that morning, when I wake up, I ask, you know, how am I feeling? If I feel depleted, mm-hmm. I ask, how did I use energy this, uh, you know, the past couple of days and what did I not replete? And then I tried that particular day to make sure that I do something to pour back into whatever that bucket may have been. Mm. I love that. We often talk, I can't tell you how many times we talk on the show about just going outside and putting our feet in the grass, even if it's for five minutes. And when we were doing the conference last week, we were really intentional about the breaks and told folks, let's walk away from the computer, like lay on the floor, go outside, go get water. You know, Shannon loves to be like, are we drinking our water? And before I forget, will you tell us about your retreat that you have? Is that something that, is it closed or is it something open? Uh, We do a retreat every, we do a couple of retreats every year. Um, I do a virtual one that's in January and then we have a in-person one that's in March. And then we just finished it up last week, actually was our last one. We do it at St. Simon Islands, Georgia. Uh, it's beautiful kind of um, South uh, Savannah look with the moss humming off of the trees and the water and the shorelines and, you know, the cranes and all of those things. <laughs> um, we have these beautiful waterfront rooms at this location that we have. And it's awesome. We have women come. Usually we tend to have between 30 to 50 women. We try to keep it reasonably small. We call, we consider that small. It's reasonably small because we like to give a lot of personal attention to the women. We like to be able to have them kind of interact with the speakers and all that are there. Um, and we speak. We put them in a waterfront room and feed them well the entire time they're there and give them a lot of opportunity to have some silent time and some time for creative rest and sometimes for social rest where they're engaging with and finding and meeting new friends. Um, You know, the best part that we the one we just finished, um, since it's so fresh on my mind, I just got home Sunday from it. Um, What we found is that a lot of times these women who come, they come with all their stuff. Like this one particular woman, she came with her her iPad and her cell phone and, you know, her computer and all her stuff. And she's coming to a rest retreat with all of her stuff. And so the first night there, we see her with all of her stuff and we tell them all, you know, look, we're asking you to de-gadget. We're asking you to, you know, you're, if you're going to have withdrawal, we're here for you, but we want you to turn it all off and leave it in your room and, and truly just come on the journey with us. And by the last day, this woman, she was so closed in and so boxed off and so kind of like, I don't really know if I want to give, get all touchy feeling and share feelings and emotions. She was the most vocal. She was an introvert who self-proclaimed she was an introvert. By the last day, she was the most vocal, had the hugest smile on her face and was in tears that she had to leave and go home. Home. She was like, I've never felt so loved and cared for. It's amazing how, how beautiful um, life is when you just allow someone else to just like, okay, we're going to take care of you for these four days. Right. Like we're going to feed you so much food. You would pop if you ate all of it. Like you don't have to worry about a single thing. And the very first thing that we do when they show up is we give them each an, a personalized gift with their name embroidered on it. It's oftentimes like a blanket or shawl or something Mm -hmm. that'll have their name embroidered on it. And and without fail, there's always a few women every year who, when they walk in and we try to put it in the room, sometimes the hotel won't let us, we'll put it on their desk. But when they, this year we had to put it on their desk because they wouldn't let us get in the rooms because of COVID. So (laughs) they walked in and some of them opened it up and tears just streamed down their face. And they're like, I've never had anybody do something so personal for me. And we're strangers to them. And, you know, (laughs) they feel like they know you because you listen to your podcast or read your book, but, but technically you're a stranger. And I think just, just that little bit of emotional and social connection and rest, it just starts the process immediately. Thank you so much for like taking care of the ladies, you know, cause it can, again, it can't just be us. Christina and I are two people. So thank <laughs> you for doing the work that you've been doing and for your time today on the show. I have one more question before we go to the, um, to the wisdom and action, but I love that. 
you know, I love having similar reactions to our conference, you know, like, thank you so much for doing this. That makes all the work worth it so that we increase mm -hmm. their wellness. So that's amazing. Um, when you were talking about your story and why you started thinking about the seven different types of rest, right? You said I was completely burned out. It had been 10 years of a career. I had two young babies. I wanted to spend time with my kids. This is where I was, right? What I heard was the difference between burnout and what were what was the percentage that you gave? You gave how many of Amer 67 percent mm -hmm. of the population is in a place of burnout, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you see is the difference, that red danger zone between burnout and complete burnout? I also, I can I add something real quick on that too? Was yeah. that statistic before the pandemic or mm. during or after the pandemic? Because I That's have a recent one. Yeah, that's okay. a recent one from uh, 2022. I think it was from okay. February of 2022. Okay. It, it was 67% of workers report that they feel burnout post pandemic. Mm. So what is and, that danger zone? And not that burnout is good that you want to start there, but what do you see? Yeah, I think for most people, you know, as I stated, a lot of us are functional burnouts. We are we are technically burned out according to the World Health Organization. We have all three criteria. We're tired. We don't like the work we do anymore. And the work that we do produce is not at the highest capacity that it, we could. So most of us are already meeting that criteria. I think it gets to a danger zone when you start seeing people not only are they kind of depressed or down from their burnout, but they're feeling used and abused from their burnout. I find that a lot of successful people, um, and I see it, like I said, because of working within internal medicine, we see a lot of very successful people end up in our ICU and ERs because they've tried to commit suicide. And we, and when we get them in these situations, what we find is that they are so busy producing goodness for other people to consume, but they haven't actually allowed themselves to consume the same goodness. They actually haven't allowed space and room and grace in their own lives to, to benefit from the what they produce. And I think, you know, it's one of those situations where I oftentimes think about the bee. The bee is busy producing honey. The bee never sits to actually eat the honey. I want to be the person who's producing and eating it at the same. I want the I want to have both aspects of it. A high producer of goodness and a high consumer of the goodness that life has to offer. I think we have to retrain people that it's okay to do both. You don't just have to be a producer of goodness and that you do deserve to consume just as much, actually more goodness than you even produce. Mm -hmm. Preach it. Absolutely. Yes. I received the goodness. Thank right? you for that answer. Yes. And, and what, I, was, what was the, I'm sorry to cut you off, Christine. What was no, the organization go, that you got the criteria for burn, burnout? Say that again. What organization did oh, you get? World the, Health. Got the World, the Health. World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. Who? So I think I have, I'm going to try to keep it at two because I know we're getting close to time. Um, Shannon always loves to ask the question, what are you currently reading? Or what is a book recommendation that you recommend to our listeners? Because our listeners tend to be book readers. And um, let's just start with that one. Yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to be I'm going to do some self promotion. And it's not the book we're talking about. It's my latest book. It's <laughs> Colorful Connections. 12 questions about race that open healthy conversation. It was written because just talking to you ladies, it was written by myself and a white female writer who I did not know who actually knew my work. She'd read my books. She, we have a similar literary agent and um, she was someone who wanted to start having more intentional conversations. And she lives in Rhode Island where it's only, I think um, less than 10% people of different ethnicities. And she was very real and raw about, I don't know how to have these conversations without being fearful. And I think it's that fear of entering into conversation of people who don't look like you that keeps us in the places that we are right now. And so that is my book recommendation. If you're someone who's Heck been afraid yes. to enter into social justice conversations, we don't do it in a confrontational way. We do it in a loving way. But I think we do have to build up people's courage to be able to do that. Oh my goodness. I can't believe we're at the end of the show talking about this. We're going to have to have your co-author come back and maybe both of y'all come back together and do a whole show around colorful conversations. That would be awesome. We would love to. Yeah. Fabulous. We will put a link to that and we will put a link to your website. And we're also going to put a link to um, the rest quiz uh, because so folks can get connected to you. Is there anything else they need to know about? Um, 
No, I think that's probably, <laughs> that'll keep them busy for a little <laughs> Since we're talking about rest, we want them to, to take it in little incremental steps. <laughs> okay. So every week we talk about wisdom and action, right? Because you can have the knowledge, but we know if you don't apply it, then it's knowledge, right? You're not using it wisely as or as effective as it could be used. So today or this week, based on your physical wellness, what is it that you're doing for yourself? Yeah, so this week, um, because I have a lot of travel that's coming up in the next two weeks, I'm being very intentional about how I'm physically using my body. Planes, mm -hmm. hotel rooms, strange pillows, strange beds all have an effect on my body. Mm -hmm. And so I'm using my foam roller. I am stretching. I'm making sure that I'm doing some, some, I am training for a marathon. So not mm -hmm. necessarily marathon training, because that's body taxing in itself, but actually just some leisure walks just to make sure that I'm getting my circulation and lymphatics moving and mm -hmm. making sure that I have my um, <laughs> compression stock socks for the plane um, so that I'm ready for next week's trips. Mm. Great ideas. Great ideas. For me, what did I write down? I really like, I have a couple of hashtags. I want to say hashtag self-awareness. Like what is, where are you uh, fatigued or uh, where's the drain, right? Because things are going to cost you something. And then how do you get refilled or refilled? Mm. I wrote down hashtag creative rest because mm. we've just launched this book. We've just launched this conference. It's been a big creative output. And you were saying about like learning new things or doing new things. And so I put hashtag creative rest because I think it's, I'm a little past that point. <laughs> I think I definitely have to do that one. Thank you so much for your time and this conversation. I feel like I could keep talking for a couple of hours about this subject. It is so fascinating to me. Well, thanks ladies for having me on. Absolutely. Yeah. Looking so forward grateful. to more conversations with you and your co-author and we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Oh my goodness. That was inspiring and affirming. Why, why so affirming for you? Because you don't feel crazy for being so tired? Well, what I realized is even though like I'm exhausted today because yeah. of the physical lack of sleep, mm -hmm. the things that she was talking about, about like going outside for five minutes or stretching, or those yeah. are practices that we talk about often on the show yeah. with our guests and each other. And mm -hmm. it also are practices that I, I do. And yeah. so, you know, sometimes, I don't know, I, I'm just going to speak for myself. I don't know what happens to y'all, but you know how sometimes when you are out of balance, like right now I'm out of balance with the sleep, yeah. then I feel like, oh, I'm not doing anything right. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, oh, I just, I haven't rested at all. Right. Yeah, yeah. And when she was talking about the different ways to refill, I was like, okay, I do yeah. that. Oh yeah. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a normal everyday practice in my life. So yeah. I think it was affirming in that way. What about for you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Right. And <clears throat> excuse me, what I look forward to is being more intentional about it. I've talked about before, like if I know that a lot is getting poured out, I'll pour a lot in. Are you putting the right things in? Right. Is mm -hmm. that actually what you need to do? Like she said, to refill the specific deficit that you have. So I think being able to be even more intentional about it um, is going to be priceless. I want to be more intentional about the monthly view. I think yeah. I've gotten pretty good at the daily view and even yeah. the weekly view. But where I where I, where I sometimes mess up is when the calendar changes, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, say for example, this um, our conference. Yeah. Somebody said to me, "Are you taking Monday off?" I was like, "No, like I'm probably taking Saturday off." And mm -hmm. <laughs> it was Doctor Cynthia Phelps, right? Self compassion. Great question. Like, yeah. really just Saturday. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it, it fascinating that like to look towards next week's schedule yeah, or next month's schedule mm -hmm. and go ahead when we have a big event and go ahead mm -hmm. and put in that time off and put in the specific self care. I hadn't mm -hmm. got that far, but I like that too. And mm -hmm. I like, I like us putting a day of rest or two after the conference. Cause I went, to work that night i didn't even finish the conference i right. <laughs> went straight to the next shift yeah right. um so yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be great and when i when i saw it that's how i felt i said oh i have to invite her even if she can't make it you know i have to try to get her on the show thank you just the, of course because just the 
article by itself gave me clarity and in, in that same feeling, especially when we talk about um, 67%. What was the article that you read? It was on the seven. It was the seven types of rest. Okay. And I said, there's different types of rest. You know, I felt like how I felt with the eight dimensions of wellness. Like I thought there was just wellness. I thought that was just rest, you know, and usually again, we think about it like sleep, but if there's right. categories, that makes sense. Well, and how beautiful they really go side by side with the eight dimensions of wellness. Mm -hmm. Like I, I want us to hold each other a little bit accountable for that. Like, for, all right. like for, maybe talking more about it and doing some work around this with the eight dimensions of wellness and the seven types yeah. of rest. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to explore this a little more, but I know we're out of okay. time. So well, no, anything no, else we the need to the podcast, but never out of time for what we need to do. Right. Right. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> I don't think so. I just think again, you know, I always want to lift up if you feel like you're tired and it does not make sense because clearly mm -hmm. high performing people have gotten here. People who are helping people have gotten here. Mm -hmm. We all can get here. Right. So if you feel like you're struggling, I let's take the test, you know, take the, um, the, what is it? The rest quiz. Right. What yeah. We're going to put that in the show notes. And yeah. also what I'm thinking about is that was not the first time I had heard the statistic about suicide for uh, mm -hmm. doctors and nurses. I had heard that statistic before from Dr. Cynthia Phelps. And, mm -hmm. and I want to put that in the show notes too about self-compassion if you are yeah. helping professional yes. and also we'll put a suicide prevention um, number in there. Because that, if yeah. you are feeling like hurting yourself or somebody else, please reach out for help that you right. are not alone. And that yeah. you can be connected. Absolutely. Yep. And yep. Be connected. That's what I love. So thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Episode 91, 10 seasons, a book launch, a conference. We'll see you next week, live at five, for the recap for season 10. In the meantime, be well, be wise, be whole. We'll talk to see you soon. See you soon.